Good morning again. Hope everybody's well. Everybody looks well. Before we get started this morning, is there anyone that would like to bring forth a word of testimony? A word of testimony. I think so often we forget to or uh, don't take time enough to bring forth testimonies. Anybody got a good testimony they'd like to give this morning? Love the Lord. Amen. That's good. Love the Lord. What else? He first loved me. Amen. Uh, I see, look back in my life and see where I failed him. You, that grace for you found that. Uh, it poured it on me. Amen. And brought me through all that I've seen. That's endured. Praise the Lord. Anyone else like to give a testimony to the Lord? Thank you for the word that we had. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Thankful for the weather. Amen. Any others? I'm thankful for my family and for letting us stay here as long as we have. And I just pray that you bless us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Any others? What well, some wonderful testimonies for sure. Well, you don't have any handouts this morning. I had some technical difficulties with my printer, so uh, I'll try to make it up to you next week. We are in part 13 of the study, The Church That Christ Built. And we're talking specifically about grace gifts or spiritual gifts. And remember that, that grace gifts are God's energy on display in our life to take care of his church 
and accomplish his will on earth. And our launch verse for the whole discussion way back 13 weeks ago is Matthew 13, 18, where our Lord looked at Peter and said, I say to you that on this, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. And from ever since then, the Lord has been building his church and he is doing so even still today. And you and I are part of this process, praise the Lord, of him building his church. And if you would look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that's where we're going to start this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look at the gifts a little closer and I'm going to give you a couple of, of uh, examples of spiritual gifts as they were used. And really this morning I want us to, to, to formulate in our minds how can God use me as I am now. And I want us to think through not trying to shoot for the stars, not trying to be something we're not, but what can God do through me now as he has created me. So in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, I'm going to start for context in verse 1, and I just want to go through and look. Now, we, we have read these scriptures, but, but they're a good reminder. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of the gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But each one is given, uh, each one is given uh, the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to the one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. And to another, the word of knowledge, according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by, by the one spirit. And to another, the, effect, the effecting of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of the, of the tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. Now, the first thing I want to bring out is that, and this is kind of a review, but, but God has given to each person a unique gift for that purpose that is needed then. So God has built you in such a way that he knows you better than anybody else. He knows your faults. He knows your strengths. He knows what buttons to push. Kind of sounds like a wife or a husband, doesn't it? God knows us intimately. And the way that God has built you, he has built you and I... And he has enabled us with the unique gift that he wants us to have for the building up of his body. And this grace gift that is inside of us, this, this gift of God is for the purpose of completing his mission. You see, we are far more than people that simply belong to a church. We are far more than people that simply have some abstract relationship with a God. No, we are, we are endowed with a manifestation of God's own spirit so that we can accomplish his purpose in this world. 
What does that mean? That means that each one of us is uniquely suited to accomplish his task. He's give you skills. He's give you varying gifts. He's made your character. He's made your, uh, he, he's woven us together. And he's made us like we are so that we're able to fulfill his purpose for this planet. That's why, excuse me, Paul used the term here, uh, the manifestation. You'll notice that term, the manifestation, the outflow. And, and notice that the emphasis here is not on the person. The emphasis is not on us as people. The emphasis that Paul uses is on God. It's on the spirit of God. And, and this is where our minds have to stretch a little bit. With God being spirit, and by us being saved, members of the kingdom of God, and him indwelling in us by the spirit, that means that his spirit is connected throughout everything and knows what the body needs. And I think sometimes that we in our bus busyness, we may uh, forget that God knows what Bill needs. God knows uh, what Miss Jane needs. And it may be that Miss Jane has a need that Bill or Adam has to take care of. Because God's made Adam or Bill suited to take care of that need. You see, that's God's spiritual gifts working in our life. <laughs> We don't have to be the fanciest. We don't have to be the best. We don't have to be the smartest. We don't have to have the most money in the whole world. All we have to do for God to use us is to open ourselves up and say, Lord, how can you use me today? Now, I felt this because in my busyness, I get busy and just go about my day and just plow through, so to speak. Just plow through. But what if we... Day, and you may already do this. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir if that's the case. But what if every day we said, Lord, by your spirit, we believe, and by your word, you'll direct us today on what we need to do and whom we need to bless. How would that work? How would it work if you were, uh, uh, as it were, vessels that God has poured into that wants to accomplish his will. Because when Paul's writing this, you got to remember, he opens the conversations saying, uh, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. So this is a direct letter to those who are saved. So we want to know how we operate in the church. What is the, the, the operating manifesto, if you would, for how we do things? And that is the scriptures. And we operate by his spirit. Take, if you would, please, and turn a few pages over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And there is a rich, rich stuff here that Paul has given us in regards to the things that God uh, has done for us. And I want to start in verse number one, Ephesians chapter one. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, he used a different word than brethren. He used the word to the saints who, had are, who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, verse 3 is, is critical. I want you to pay attention. Listen now. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what, let's read that next section again. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now that's, that's big, folks. So, it's not that we at New Salem, 
have to sit and wonder, well, is God is, is God going to bless us as a church? The Bible said he's already blessed us in every blessing. He's already blessed us in every blessing. Notice where it's at, though. In every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places, in Christ. You see, because we are followers of Christ, because we have a dynamic relationship with him, our blessings don't necessarily... Uh, are, are bound here, but our blessings are in Christ. And the gift that he has given you out of these blessings is guaranteed to accomplish his will. The problem is us who stand in the way. Maybe God called you to do something. It's, it's, it's a given that not all people are called to preach. Some are. It's a given that not all people are, are called in the ministry of, of, of singing. Now, y'all tolerate me singing because you're so kind. Because I know that's not a gift I have. I can whistle, though. But, hey, I like to sing. But God's called me to preach. Maybe God's called you and, and enabled you with a gift of encouragement. You know, that's a gift. You ever met somebody that just every time you're around them, they seem like they're encouraging? They're building up as opposed to breaking down. You see, this world likes to break down. But we need God's people. What did it do? Oh, it went off? That's better? Okay. Thank you, brother. I couldn't hardly hear that. So we need people that's not going to break down. We need people that's going to build up and in Christ he's blessed us with every every blessing let's continue just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he has predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise and of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. You see, our, our, our confidence, our very life, is so sewn up in the person and work of Jesus Christ that the very, uh, the very fuel for all that we have and do comes from Christ. That's why we don't look around and get totally discouraged because numbers fall off. That's why we don't get discouraged to the point of, of defeat when we look at the world and see that the world is, is seemingly going to hell in a handbasket. Because my Bible says that Jesus Christ is sitting on the right hand of the Father. That's a position of royalty. Our great King Christ is there and he's ruling. And I tell you this, he's ruling through us. Do you understand that God has, has, has God's accomplishing work on this earth is through you all? You might not have thought when you got out of the bed this morning that God was working through you to accomplish his divine plan, but that's exactly what he does. Because all God does in this world, he does through his blessed children. And his blessed children are only coming through the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on, he says, in him, I love the in him. In him you have redemption. We've been saved through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according not only to our riches and grace, but according to his riches and grace. Now, now, <clears throat> this is so special here because the Bible just doesn't say God extended grace to us. Like it's some rigid ploy to just give us something. No, the Bible uses this term, which, and I'm in verse 8, he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. That means that he put all the grace on us through Jesus Christ. 
You see, your very life is fulfilled, not because of money you have, not because of things that you possess, not because of the way that you and I look. Your life is fulfilled because the person and work of Christ, the grace has been lavishly placed on you, and he expects us to take this grace and bring his kingdom to the earth. That's why our Lord said, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. Now, God in his greatness, he could say, I want my kingdom there. There it is. And, 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 and all of evil, all of Satan, everything would be just done away with in an in a, in a instant faster than we can imagine. But he has decided in his foreknowledge, in his wisdom to operate through the church for now. So that the place that you and I hold in this operation is a place of, 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 of royal engagement. You see, we are fighting in the king's army. You understand that, right? King Jesus is fulfilling his operation in this earth through us. We are soldiers. It doesn't matter how old you are. You may be thinking, well, I'm too old to be a soldier. I can barely get out of the bed. You're still up on this side of the ground right now, right? He's not taking us to glory. So that means he's still got something for you to do right now. It's up to you to find out what that is. The preacher can help you. The preacher can point you with tools. But you know how God is ministering to you. And you know how God is tugging at your heart to do certain things. Maybe there is encouragement. Maybe you're supposed to be giving some encouragement to somebody. Maybe you're not using some gift of administration God's given you. Maybe he's given you a great gift of mercy and compassion. You know, we could use some mercy and compassion in this world today, right? You see, these are things that God has enabled us with. Now, I promised you that I would give you a couple examples of some spiritual gifts. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. One of probably my favorite female character of the scriptures. And I tell you, I probably say that about all of them when I come up. You'll notice that about me. The one I'm studying about right here because my favorite one, I just can't help it. It's the way it is. Acts chapter number 9. We read this, or we studied rather through this when we came through the book of Acts. And we're going to be looking at verse 36. And we're going to talk about Tabitha or Dorsus. I'm so wanting to meet her when I get to heaven. And, and, and the reason is because she is a perfect picture of someone who uses their gifts for the glory of God. Verse 36 of Acts chapter 9 says this. Now in Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorsus. And if you further translate that, it means gazelle. Now I don't know whether she was tall and skinny. I don't, I don't know. But her name was Tabitha. And, and it says, this woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it came about that at the time she fell sick and she died. And when they washed her body, they laid her in the upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa, uh, Peter was there. And he sent, they sent two men to him entreating him, do not delay to come to us. And Peter rose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him into the upper room and all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorsus used to make while she was with them. Peter sent them all out, and he knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it came and it became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Praise the Lord. And it came about that he stayed many days in Joppa with a certain tanner named uh, Simon. Now, 
Let's break this down here. So what would be a characteristics of those who use their spiritual gift for the glory of God? Well, number one, we find here in verse 36, this scripture uses the term, this woman was abounding, was abounding. That means that, that, that she was filled up, she was overflowing, she was complete to the max. Now, now, so so instead of being about her own desires, instead of being consumed with her own hobbies, instead of being consumed with the things of the world, it says that she was abounding, that she was filled up with what? Kindness and charity. She was filled up with kindness and compassionate deeds. She wasn't tied into the world. The Lord had got a hold of her heart at some point that we don't know. And she was consumed and full with the work of God. With the work of God. That's why it says she was abounding. They overflowed out of her with kindness and charity, which she continually did. And we can see here from verse 39 of her impact on the widows there. Now, keep in mind, at this time, widows were, you know, the life expectancy was not as long as it was today. Frequently, uh, uh, women in the church became widows. The church took it very seriously to take care of the widows the best they could. And this dear lady, Tabitha, had decided that she was going to make some cloaks for some of these widows. Now, this term here, here, coats, or it uses the term in 39, uh, tunics and garments. That means she made undergarments of some fashion, as well as outside clothes. So her gifts that God had given her, she used that to bless the widows. And it so moved them when she died that they brought the cloaks to Peter and said, Look, Peter, look at what she used to do for us. You see, this is a sign of someone who has radically been saved by the Lord and is in turn using her gift to bless other people. I want to ask you, church, what are you doing to bless other people? We know we're not rich. We know we, we may not be sports stars. We may not be Hollywood actors. But are we using... The gifts God has given us to bless those around us. That's what Tabitha did. And, and, and we got to remember, she couldn't go out to Walmart. She didn't go down the corner of Walmart and buy, uh, <laughs> buy the tunics. No, she made the tunics. She purchased the cloth. <laughs> she made the tunics. She, she blessed these widows. And it kind of reminds me, and I know a lot of people don't do it now, but how many of you's mother or grandmother used to make the uh, uh, used to make the blankets? You remember the the sewed patch blankets? You remember some of y'all may make them yourself. My wife's grandmother had given her uh, a couple, and other people had given us uh, blankets that mean a lot to us. They took their time and they stitched them little stitches together. And, and they give them in kindness. Uh, uh, Tabitha here was given them out of necessity. These wouldn't have been rich widows. This points to that they was had a measure of poverty. And she used the gift inside of her to try to bless these. Now, I'm going to do something a little similar. I'm going to go outside the scripture. And I'm going to give you an example of another lady who did some of the same things. And you all just have to pardon me. Uh, I'm going to use my PowerPoint here so that I can read it. I want to talk to you just for a minute about another young lady who lived in the 12th century who used her gifts and talents. And her name was Elizabeth of Hungary. Elizabeth of Hungary. Now, that's how you say it. It's spelled Hungarian, but it's Hungary. I looked it up. My wife looked it up. It's Hungary. And I call Elizabeth of Hungary the princess who loved the poor. 
Now, she was born way back in 1207. I know it's a long time ago. Way back. We can't fathom that far back. That was prior to the Reformation. That was prior to Martin Luther doing all he did. And, and so she was born long ago, and she was the king of Hungary's daughter. Her, her father's name was King Andrew. So she was a princess. And back in this day, it was big to be a king. If you think it's, how many of you seen Queen Elizabeth on the TV and you've seen all that stuff? Well, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance. And that's how it was back then. To be a king, to be a princess was a big deal. You had all the money, all the royalty, all this stuff. Well, at the age of 14, she was married off to a fellow by the name of Louis. And Lewis lived in what was near present-day Germany today, and she was married off in one of these, almost like a marriage that would secure lands, that would give a stronghold in certain places. That's how they did things back in the old days. You know, we think 14 just, well, that's, that, you know, but, but, but then it was calm. So she married Lewis, and she moved to this grand castle called Wartburg Castle. Now, if you get home, you can look up Wartburg Castle. It's still there today, and it is a massive thing. It, it is a, a beautiful castle. By the way, several hundred years later, Martin Luther lived at Wart, Wartburg Castle for a while, but, but her and her husband lived in Wartburg Castle. They had three children. Money, just everywhere. Riches, everywhere. Had no needs at all. But you see, uh, uh, Elizabeth, had heard some preachers come to town. And there was this fellow by the name of St. Francis of Assisi. Now, back in these days, there wasn't no Baptist, there wasn't no Methodist. There was just simply the Catholic Church. That was all. It wasn't the same as what we know it today, but it was the church. So this fellow named Francis of Assisi started an order within the church that had heavy giving to the poor. They would sell everything they have, they would go serve the poor. They would take care of them. They tender wounds and so forth. So Elizabeth heard one of these preachers. He came to the town. She heard one of these preachers. Her husband heard one of these preachers. And she got, she got touched. So she decided that she would use her riches and her resources to help the poor. And it said that she often... And did I mention she was 14 years old when she got married? So this is a, a young guy. She would often dress up in uh, uh, normal clothing that would be outside of what a princess would usually wear. She would go outside the, 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 the go, go outside the castle and she would intermingle with the common people, with the poor, with the peasants. And she would bless them. She would give them money. She would take them food. She would try to bless them with, with what God had given her. Well, it come along that Lewis died. And, and Lewis uh, passed away. Lewis's brother-in-law did not like her still living in the castle with all that money. So he kicked her out. So she had to move out with the same poor people that she was helping. Well, she ended up getting her dowry and we don't use that term now but back then they had a dowry where you would give a dowry for your daughter etc so she got her dowry she moved to a place called marburg to make a long story short she built a hospital the the moral of the story is she used what she had to bless people in the name of god's service she died when she was 24 years old died when she was 24 years old and when I read that, she became one of my, I know she's not in the scripture, but she is a real life person that lived, a real life princess. And when I was teaching this to my, my girls, I said, look, y'all y'all, y'all like princesses. This is the real princess. And look what she did. You see, she took what God gave her and she blessed. This is the question, church. This is the question for us to consider. Are we going to use the spiritual gifts God gives us, are we going to waste them? Are we going to use whatever resources it is that God's given us to bless, or are we simply going to waste them? Or are we going to be like Tabitha? Are we going to be like Elizabeth? And the thing is, 
that Tabitha was an ordinary person. Elizabeth, besides being a, a princess, was an ordinary person. You see, beloved, the, 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 the biblical pattern is not that God uses the smart, the fashionable, the rich. No, as a matter of fact, it's on the other side. God uses the plain. God uses the ordinary. God uses the unremarkable so that in turn the glory can go to him. So I'm going to leave with this thought. What are you doing and what can you do more to use the gift God's given you? You know, if you was going to define a healthy church, many people define a healthy church by numbers. And say, oh, you got a thousand. Surely you must be healthy. God defines a healthy church if his people is loving him and serving one another and truly loving one another. That's what a healthy church is. You know, it's amazing. We're all inundated as human beings with numbers. God doesn't seem to be twisted up by numbers much, if I can use that phrase. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Everybody stand their feet. Bill, what are we going to sing? We're going we're gonna to go out with a, with, a, with a singing here. What are we going to sing? Y'all want to sing the first verse of Amazing Grace as an act of him? And if anybody wants to come pray, you can certainly come pray. If you need to talk to anybody about knowing the Lord Jesus, I'll be glad to talk to you after service about knowing the Lord. Okay, brother, lead us in. Amazing.